I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 6 this morning. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered, scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We're continuing our series today. I have decided. I have decided. I have made up my mind. Heavenly Father, we love you today. God, we thank you for your plan, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy that you are a good father today, God. Lord, we rebuke again the spirit of fear and doubt and intimidation today. And God, we stand on the promises in your word today, God, that you're working everything together for our good today, God, and that we can trust you. And we thank you for your word this morning, God. Help us to take a moment today to consider your words to your church, to your body this morning. And Father, if there's even one person here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ, the Savior today, God, I pray before they leave this place that they will turn away from their sins and turn to the Savior today and become a part of your family by grace through faith this morning, we pray. And God, help us, teach us your ways today, I pray. God, help us to be like you today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're in a series, I Have, I have Decided. And in this series, we've been talking about our decisions. Our decisions are incredibly uh, important. And our thought in this series has been this. The quality of your decisions determines the quality of your life. The quality of the decisions and choices that you make determine the quality of your life. And the bad news, if there is any bad news, and there, there usually is some bad news, is that we're not very good at making good decisions or making good choices. That's why the writer in Proverbs 16 says this, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and God will establish your thoughts. Literally, put God first in your life and God will help you to make the right kind of decisions and the right kind of thinking in your life. And here is our key thought for today. I have decided, I have made up my mind that with God's help, I'm going to be irrationally generous. How many of you think that you are a generous person today? Let me see your hand today. Be proud of that today. I'm a generous person. How many of you are irrationally generous? Say, Pastor, I don't even know exactly what that means. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Making up our mind in advance, deciding, I have decided I'm going to be irrationally uh, generous. I am told by people who study such things that the average person today is bombarded by over 10,000 ads every single day. 10,000 ads every single day. And that is because we carry a little billboard around with us. How many of you have a phone? How many of you carry your phone at all times? How many of you are like me, if you look down and you don't have your phone and you can't feel your phone anywhere, you're like, oh my goodness, where is my phone? And we almost panic, but that little phone we have helps to bombard us with these ads all day long. The phones, they can even learn what you like, what you don't like. And if you don't know what you like, they'll tell you what you like in case you, you didn't know. But we're bombarded by 10,000 ads a day, and according to 
uh, uh, people who study these kinds of things and, and, and scientists that study anthropology and, and people today, they tell us that this is not good that we're bombarded by all of these ads. And this is what they tell us, that the more ads we see, the more miserable we become. And you look around at our culture and our society today and you see a bunch of miserable people. In fact, most of them are so miserable they act like they are angry at something or somebody all of the time. And why is that? Because every waking moment we are reminded of what we don't have. That's what an ad is. It's showing you something that you don't have, that it wants you to feel like you need. And we're always looking at these ads thinking, man, I don't have that and I'm not what I need to be. And so there is a pervasive message that is being sent to us by the culture every single day, by these phones that we carry around, by our television when we're at home, and by our computers. And that is if you want to be happy, you need to get more. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you want more? Sometimes we say that in church from a spiritual standpoint. How many of you want more? And we should want more spiritually, but usually we really don't want more spiritually, we believe the lies that the culture is sending us. To be happy, you've got to get more, you've got to acquire more, you've got to accumulate more. That is how to be happy. That's why people buy lottery tickets. Wishing, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands either of how many people buy lottery tickets. You say, well, if you don't, if you don't buy a ticket, you can't win. I guess that's true. But, but the chances of winning, you're, you're more likely to have a meteorite drop down on your head than you are to, to win the lottery. But we all want to win the lottery because we believe the big the big lie more is is better you can't have a good life certainly without an iphone or a phone you can't have a good life without the right kind of shoes not just ladies men like shoes too i've always wanted a pair of shoes like this got them on sale i'm not going to tell you where i got them or what kind they are but i got them for less than 40 dollars somebody say hallelujah praise god you're not happy if you don't have that purse. You're not happy if you don't have Netflix. How many of you binge on Netflix? Let me see your hand. Bunch of liars. That's okay. Some people are honest in here today. The culture screams at us with this thought. It is more blessed to get. You are more blessed the more that you, that you get, the more that you receive. But Jesus had a very 2,000 years ago countercultural message. In Acts 20 and verse 35, his teaching is revealed to us there, and he says this It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. The opposite of what our culture is telling us today. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. What does that word blessed or blessed mean? It literally means happy or joyful. In other words, Jesus said it, is, it will make you happier and more joyful to give than it will make you to receive. I love it at Christmas time to ask little children, and they usually get asked the question, what are you getting for Christmas? What is Santa Claus bringing you for Christmas? But I always ask them the same question. Tell me real quick, whisper, what are you getting your parents for Christmas? And I have yet to get an answer from a little kid whether because they're, they're all worried about what they are getting for Christmas. But Jesus says you're happier, you're more joyful if you give, more fulfilled, more blessed if you give than if you receive. And I, you know, I, I'm optimistic. I believe that most people, uh, at least most people in church today, most people that we call ourselves Christians want to be givers. How many of you in your heart of hearts you want to be a giver? You want to be irrationally uh, generous. And I think most people enjoy giving and they want to give more. But for one reason or another, they feel like they can't. Man, if I just had more, I would give more. Boy, if I could win the lottery, then I would be a tither. And you'd make your pastor very happy, by the way, if you won the lottery and you tithe on that. I don't even know what it is up to now. I think somebody just won it the other day in California. Amen. The rich get richer. Somebody say amen. I actually saw this news story, actual news story of a man 
in his little local town who had won a lottery, won I think four or five hundred thousand dollars, and the, the news media was covering him there, and they had him in the convenience store reenacting when he bought the ticket that he won, and because and, he had given some of it to charity, and so it made the news there. And he was in there, and he bought a little scratch-off ticket, and he's scratching it off for the B-roll, for the cameras. And as he's scratching it off, he almost fell out on the floor. He said, I just won another $2 million. I thought, what did that guy eat for breakfast that day? Well, I want to know what he's eating. He's eating some kind of Wheaties or something. But, but Jesus said you're more joyful if you give. And most of us want to give, but we feel like for one reason or another that we can't. And this is what we're going to talk about today. How to become irrationally generous. Why do we want to become irrationally generous? Because God is irrationally generous generous. It's called grace. Somebody say, thank God for grace. And anytime you are tempted not to give grace to somebody else, you need to deny that demonic spirit within you and say, no, 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 no. I've been given grace by God, and yeah, that person messed up, or they offended me, or they sinned, or whatever they did, but I'm going to offer them the same kind of grace I want God to offer me. Somebody say, praise the Lord for grace today. How to become irrationally generous and this is what we're talking about today. I have decided, I have made up my mind to be irrationally generous. Why? Why? Because no one ever accidentally becomes irrationally generous. It's not something that randomly happens to you. No one ever randomly begins tithing and giving regular in, into the offering fund. Nobody begins by accident to fund missionaries to help families, to help people with their rent, to help people with their groceries, to help the homeless, or to help the cause of world missions. We never go randomly or accidentally from 10% to 12% to 15% to 25% by chance or haphazardly. It does not happen that way. If we want to be more generous, and when we think we can't, then we need to make up our mind today. I am deciding today that I'm going to be more irrationally generous. Again, we want to, but we think that we can. Here's what we tell ourselves. We say, when I have more, then I'll give more. When I have more to give, then I will be more generous. But that is not how people who are truly generous, they don't think that way. They don't think, man, when I have more, then I'm going to give because they already have a spirit of generosity within them. Because this is the point I want to make today. Generosity is not about what you have or don't have. It is about what's in your heart. Generosity is not about how much you have or don't have. It is about what is in your heart. And you can prove this because there are people that we would consider poor today that are very, very generous. They'll give you the shirt off their back if that's all they have to give. There's also poor people today that are very, very stingy. Some of them, that's how they became poor. There's also rich people today that are stingy, obviously, like Ebenezer Cro uh, Scrooge and others today. But there are also rich people today, what we would call rich, that are very, very generous. Why? Because it's not about how much you have or don't have. It's about what is in your heart. And here's what we're going to learn how to do today. We're going to learn to be generous now. Right now in our current condition. Because if we are not generous now, we will not be generous later. There's a parable that I love that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12. It's about a man there that was already doing pretty well. In fact, the Bible already calls him a, a, a rich man. How many of you heard the saying that the rich get richer? Sometimes it's true. Uh, but there was a, a man that the Bible already says is kind of a, a wealthy man, and he has a, a field there, and he has a big harvest, an overwhelming harvest. And so what does he do? Does he say, hey, I have more, and now I'm really going to be generous? Now I'm going to give like I've never given before. I'm going to tithe more. I'm going to give to the homeless shelters more. I'm going to give to feed the poor more. I'm going to give to the old Savannah City Mission more. I'm going to give to missionaries more. Absolutely not. That is not what he says. What did the man do when he had more? He did what he had always done before. 
the exact same thing he had done before as what he did when he got a big bountiful blessing. Jesus said it this way. Then the man said, I know what I'll do now. I'll tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And then I will sit back and I will say to myself, friend, you have enough stored up for years to come. Now take it easy. Sit back, relax, and be merry. In other words, more money does not make you more generous. More money just makes you more of what you already are. More money, more things don't change who you are. Instead, it reveals who you really are on the inside in your heart. And so here's our key takeaway today. If you want to be generous when you have more, you need to learn to be generous now. If you want to be generous after you win the lottery or when you make it big in life, then you need to learn to be generous now when you have less. You need to make up your mind, I have decided to be irrationally generous now. I want to, Pastor Todd, if you just knew my condition, well, you're not on your own because you have God helping you. Somebody say amen today. Generosity is not just something you do. Generosity is an identity today. And there's two characteristics of generous people that I want us to look at very quickly this morning. Number one, generous people are not generous randomly. Generous people have a plan for their generosity. Generous people plan to be generous. You might say, well, Pastor Todd, I thought that that generosity was something like this. It was, you know, coming across someone that has a need randomly and just randomly blessing that person. That is not necessarily generosity that's giving. That's one-time giving in that specific situation. You may see a a guy or a a girl on a corner, and and they're out there, and they've got their little sign, and you hand them some money. By the way, that is not always the best way to help them. If you really want to help them, you get them somewhere that can really help them. You get them to a place that can provide them with safety and with shelter and and with three hot meals a day and and a good warm bed at night and somewhere that can help them to get out of their situation. But a lot of those people don't want that. A lot of those people are strung out on drugs. If you give them money, you're just feeding their drug addiction. Say, Pastor Todd, what do you do? I've given them water before. I have given them hot meals and sandwiches before, and you can do that. But whatever you do... Don't disrespect them. You don't know who they are or what they've been through, and it might be an angel from heaven standing on that corner. So you need to send some prayers and love and respect their way. But it's not always good to give them money, but some people think that's what generosity is. Here's a couple bucks or some change. Maybe you're in line in the grocery store, and you see someone behind you, and you realize that that they're not doing all that well, and you offer to buy their groceries. Some people think that that is generosity. How many of you ever bought somebody's meal behind you in a drive-thru? I've never done that, but it's been done to me. I was in a drive-thru at Chick-fil-A one day, and I got up to the window, and they said, the car in front of you bought your meal. I said, well, praise God, that's wonderful. Now I can play golf. No, I didn't say that. Now I can give more to my church. But some people think that those random acts of generosity or kindness is generosity, but it's really not. It is just giving. It is not true generosity. Now, let me just be clear about this. Giving is good. Everybody say giving is good. Anytime you give, that is a good thing, and you want to do it, but it's not necessarily generosity. Why? Because generous people don't have to be guilted into giving or pressured into giving. They don't have to happen upon the right kind of circumstance and have enough extra money left over to do it. They have a plan for their generosity. They are not reactive. They're not giving just because they see a need or because they are prompted into giving and they have that extra money on them. Generous people have a plan. Look back in our text this morning. Paul says here in verse 6, he said, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. When he's talking about sowing and reaping, he's talking about giving. How many of you know that there's two ways to give? There's two ways to give. You can give sparingly or you can give bountifully. 
Paul is teaching us here the laws of sowing and reaping. But he says, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. For each of you should give what you have decided in your heart, in advance, before to give. Not reluctantly, not randomly, not haphazardly, and not out of compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver who has decided in advance, they have made up their mind that they are going to be generous. That is the kind of a giver that God, that God loves and that God wants. And so we're saying today, I'm not waiting until I have more. I have decided I'm not making excuses for what I don't have now because generosity is not what I do. It is who I am today. Some of you say plan. You say, Pastor Todd, I don't have a plan. And for some of you, that, that is your problem. You have a plan. You just don't have a plan written down, and it's probably not a very good plan, but most of us have plans. Maybe you have plans for Christmas. How many of you are already planning what gifts you're going to buy for Christmas or who you're going to buy for for Christmas? Hannah says no. Hannah, come on now. You're fixing to have a brand new grandbaby. You're going to get that grandbaby something. It's going to be only a month old, but she's going to get that grandbaby uh, uh, something for Christmas. Or or are we planning for for buying up that big purchase we want, that car, that that home? Or, or maybe hopefully some of you are, are planning on on retirement, but but we need to have a plan one way or another because if we don't have a plan, if you fail to plan, then you're planning to what? Planning to fail. But usually we have a plan. It's just usually not a very good one. But generous people by nature don't plan to consume. They don't plan to get, but they strategically and prayerfully plan to give or plan how they're going to so, and it is not spontaneous, it is not emotional, it is not random, but it is intentional. I have decided, again, you say, Pastor Todd, I'm not a planner, I'm not a budgeter. How many of you are budgeters? I hate math, but thank God for Excel. How many of you know what Excel is? You get Excel and it does all the math equations for you. All you got to do is, is punch in, in your numbers, but some of you need to actually make a, a budget. I don't know if my grandfather said this. If he didn't, he certainly thought this, and I've heard my dad say it from time to time, this about budgeting your money. When your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. And here's what a lot of people do. They get into the cycle of spending or consuming and then lack and then worry. And it starts like this. You spend more than you make. And then you have more month than you have money. And then you have more worry than you know what to do with. That is the cycle that a lot of people get into. And I'm here to tell you today, this is not a budgeting problem. It's not even a money problem. It is a spiritual problem. Everybody say spiritual. It is a spiritual problem where you're trusting in something else when you ought to be trusting in, in God. In our text again, he who sows who you supply seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. What is Paul talking about here? The Apostle Paul is talking about something that is spiritual in nature. He uses words like righteousness here. He talks about how that God in heaven will turn around and reciprocate to you uh, when your heart is generous and when you give out to others. And he's referencing a principle here that we have in Scripture. He doesn't represent, reference it by the law or by the name, but he's actually referencing the tithe here. How many of you are familiar with the concept of tithe? How many of you are familiar in math with the concept of 10%? That's about the only math I can do. I can figure 10% out of most, th most things, especially if it is a whole number. 10% of $100 is $10. I know that 10% of $30 is $3. Most of us can do that. Well, the Bible talks about 
the tithe, and it talks about it long before it makes it a part of the law. Jesus talks about it afterwards, and the Apostle Paul is referencing it here. Here's how the Lord talks about tithe in the book of Malachi. It says this. I want the musicians to come to the instruments today. He says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, says the Lord. Trust me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open up the floodgates of heaven and pour you out so much of a blessing that there will not be room enough in your life to store it. You might say, he's talking about giving 10% of your income. I could not possibly afford that. I remember when I first got married, Sandra and I first got married, and we had that first April the, uh, or the second April of the second year uh, when our income taxes came due, and I'll never forget it, the bill was $1,200. $1,200. I thought, my God, it'll take us the rest of our lives to pay this off, $1,200 bill here. And at that time, it was hard for me to imagine, and I was kind of forced because I was already working in the church there to give 10%. But I thought, how can I do that and pay off this bill? And, do and some of you think like that. How could I possibly give 10% of my increase to God? There's no way I could afford that I'd have to rearrange my life for God. And let me tell you what, it's not about that. It is about trusting God. How much can you trust God? God with, and God says the tenth belongs to the Lord. Don't touch it. Trust me with the tithe, the first tenth, the first and the best that you have. You can trust me with that. You say, Pastor Todd, what do I do if I can't afford to tithe now? Well, first of all, if you can't afford to tithe, you're in a mess already. But if you can't afford to tithe, praise God, we serve a God that is a good father, and he's a God of grace. And I'm not going to force anybody in this church to give 10% of your income, but I'm going to encourage you and exhort you to trust God in that. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven. And if you do that, if you put God first, all of these things you've been worrying about, I'll take care of those things. One prophet in the Old Testament says, it's like you got a bag full of holes, and you can't ever get enough in your bag because it's full of holes. So if you learn how to trust God with the first and the best, the tithe, offerings above, above and beyond that, with a heart of generosity, you say, what do I do if I, if I can't tithe? Pick a number a month that you can give. It may be $3 a month. It may be $10 a month. It may be $30 a month. But pick a number that you can give. And if you can give that, then you find out what percentage of that is that of your income. That may be 1%. If it's 1%, say, God, help me to trust you with 2% next time. God, help me to trust you with 3% until you work your way up to 10 Let me tell you something. You cannot outgive God, and I believe his promises are yes and amen. And if he says, if you trust me with the tithe, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot receive. Jesus follows that up. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And then Jesus goes on in Matthew 6, and he says it like this. He says, you cannot serve God and serve money. You can't have two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other. What are you trusting in today? If you're going to be irrationally generous, it begins by saying, God, I take you at your word. God, I am trusting you today. Because it's not just about 10% of your income. Some people say in the New Testament that it doesn't preach the tithe. It doesn't talk about the tithe, but it does. They talk about it because they're talking to people that they assume know about the tithe there and that it predates the law and all that kind of stuff. You might say, well, Pastor Todd, it says in the New Testament we're not under the law, but we're under grace. How many of you are under grace today? Here's what Jesus and the New Testament writers say about grace. Grace, whatever the law says to do, the law says go one mile, grace says go two miles. Grace says you go beyond that. And people who are generous, they plan to be generous. But the second point today is that people who are generous, they always go the extra mile. They give a little bit extra. Because that's who they are. You might say, Pastor, I'm not there yet today. Commit your ways to the Lord and He will establish your thoughts. Pastor Todd, are you trying to raise the tithe up here at the church? You know, we had a board meeting this past week, and we looked at the tithe for the month of September, and it was bigger than we had the tithe the year before. 
Our finances are strong. Praise God. Somebody give God a praise that our finances are strong here. I'm not, I'm not preaching this message because we're in a pinch or we're in a bind. I'm preaching this message because this is a spiritual thing. It is more blessed to be generous and to be a giver than it is to receive. And I believe it and I live it and this church believes it. This church lives it out. That's why this church, we give to the old Savannah City Mission. We give to the women's uh, uh, center here in town. We give to neighbors feeding neighbors and four days a week out of this church, out of our tithe fund here. We give about $20,000 a year to help feed people in Savannah. Not only that, but we're helping families. This is because of the tithe that God runs through your fingers into this church. And we're helping keeping families together, providing beds for children and other items that families need to keep their children out of foster care or for children who are already in foster care. Not only that, but we give regularly thousands and thousands of dollars a year to world missions. At the end of the year last year, we gave $6,000 to Hannah's ministry, ma'am, missionary assistance ministry. And we're still sowing seed into that. And some of you sow seed into that personally. We gave $1,000 in one service two weeks ago to a little a couple of missionaries, Jonathan and Nicole Moore, that were raised up in this church and in this area. We gave them $1,000 in one service cash money. And I'm praying, God, help us do more. God, help us to pledge to give them on a monthly basis. Basis. So, Pastor Todd, what do you do? I don't, you don't do your alms before men, but I pay my tithe. I give offerings, undesignated mo monies above and beyond that. I give to the old Savannah City Mission. I give to world missions. And you ought to say, God, lay things on my heart that I can, even if it's $3, even if it's $5 a month, God, I want to be a generous person. This is a spiritual thing. Everybody stand on your feet with me this morning. And I want us to do a little quick, quick exercise. And it's only 12.04. The restaurant will wait for you this morning. A quick little exercise. I want you to think about what is, what is the financial plan in my life? What, what is my, my income? A am I just wanting to take care of my family, but, but everybody else is on their own? I'm not going to worry about anybody else. Is your plan just to, to make all the money that you can make and you'll find that there's emptiness in that is your plan to save all the money that you can save again there's spoil in that is the plan to, to, to spend all the money that I can spend and consume all the things that I can consume there is ruin in that for you what is your financial plan what is the end game in your life of the money that God gives you strength and knowledge you might say I'll make my own money I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business person, or I have the skills that I have developed, I've gotten my education. Listen, you couldn't have done any of that without God's help in your life. Giving you a mind, giving you these ideas, strengthening you, empowering you to do that. What is the end game in your life with your finances? And I want to give you a suggestion today. The end game in your life with your finances ought to be to bring glory and honor to God. To bring glory and and honor to God. Say, but Pastor Todd, I got to live. I got to eat. I got to have a roof over my head. I got to have clothes. I got to be able to retire. If you seek first the kingdom of God, all of these things will be added unto you. You either believe it or you don't. And again, I'm not telling people, and I don't believe in being, in being dumb. I believe in living by faith, and I don't believe in just being dumb. Do what you can do. Pray. Say, God, help me to do more. And God will help you. Say, God, change my heart. I need a heart of generosity. God will speak to you. God will change your heart. I want to close with this. Verse 11 in 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says, if you do these things, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God and glory and honor to God. Folks, whether it is this church, us together as a church, my only concern is that we bring glory and honor to God as the pastor here. And my only concern for you personally, I'm not, I'm not trying to get people just to give more so that this church will have more to spend. I want you in your life 
to live to bring glory and to bring honor to God. You either believe it or you don't. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. I've made up my mind. I have decided with God's help, I'm going to be irrationally, irrationally generous. Irrationally generous. Especially at times when I think someone doesn't doesn't deserve it. I'm going to close with a story which is a true story. I don't know who the person was, but it was a true story, an actual account in their life. But a man was in a restaurant and the waitress was late getting to his table. When she got there, she was curt and short with him, acted like she was in a hurry took his order, got his food out late, got his order wrong, acted like she was upset at him and really he should have been upset at her, was almost rude to the man and at the end of the meal, and it was just him eating by himself as a $10 or $15 meal, and he left a $20 bill down there on that table. Went out into the parking lot to get into his car and the waitress comes running out into the parking lot to meet the man there, a Christian man. She says, sir, I don't know why you did that. I didn't deserve it. I was rude to you. I was ugly to you. He said, well, I'm a Christian. God has showed me grace in my life. And I just wanted to show that same grace back to you. And she said, two weeks ago, my husband left me and my two little kids. And I've been barely been able to make ends meet and put food on my table. And now today, one of my little children is sick, and I had to leave them crying and sick with another person, and I feel eat up with guilt that I'm having to do that and having to come to work today, but I'm sorry that I took it out on you. He was able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and lead that little waitress to Jesus right there because he had a heart of irrational generosity. Instead of giving back what he thought that that woman deserved. Folks, that's the way that God wants us to live our lives. Live our lives like that and to do it intentionally. I have decided. I have decided. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want everybody just to lift your hands up to heaven with me. Say, God, I have decided. I believe what you said in your word. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. God, I believe it. God, help me to live it today. God, with your help, I will become irrationally generous. God, I will be a tither. God, I will give offerings. I will give to missions. I will give to help people in need here locally. God, I will give to families, God. God, I will be generous. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to trust in you more today, I pray, God. Lord, help us to trust you today, Lord.